get to, through these three cool cases here pretty quickly. Um, I use Instagram for a lot of people saying funny things all over uh, Instagram. So I follow a few funny people. And once in a while I screenshot some stuff. I might find useful in a lecture so now. This was one of those uh, times. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so the first case. This was a patient of mine. Uh, again, it's kind of like one of those index cases where uh, it, it just um, made such an impact on me, the ability to save somebody's life using ultrasound. And it also involved a medical student. And so in that sense, it made it a really cool case. But this patient that I blurred her face out so you can't see who it is, but she did survive. So there's a good ending to this, uh, luckily, and that's what makes the case so cool, I think. Uh, but she's a 22-year-old female. She came in, she was having an asthma attack by the next door neighbor. And uh, she was uh, bradycardic, hypotensive, the paramedics bring her in. She's, she's got, uh, she's kind of loud. She's, um, she's a PA when they bring it to us. And um, it's a little weird because we've got this person who's having an asthma attack. And uh, we're listening to her lungs, you know, we've intubated her now, we're listening to her lungs. And, you know, between CPR listening and her lungs are clear. And so um, we start resuscitating her fluids, we start getting the pulse back. And um, the, we're wondering why would this person be so sick and have clear lungs, supposedly having you know this severe respiratory failure and asthma attack and everything. She was pretty easy to bag actually. And so then um, we somebody brought up the idea. Frankly, I think it was a medical student who said, you know, she was found outside. Maybe she was like I don't know, hit by a car. And uh, why don't we do a fast scan? And I was like, that's a silly idea. Yeah, let's do a fast scan. And so we, uh, we did. We did a fast scan on her, not knowing why she was out in front of her house. And I don't know if you can see this up here or not, but this is a little uh, area right here that's got some fluid here between the kidney and the liver. And sure enough, uh, it's a positive fast scan. Now, these, these are really old ultrasound machines. This was a, one of my earlier cases I had. And so uh, pardon the images here, but, uh, but you can see there's fluid there. And then we did a really good secondary survey. We like cut the clothes off the patient, head to toe exam, not a single scratch on this patient. And we are in the three OBGYN cases here, so you know where this is all going. <laughs> but, <laughs> pretend you didn't for a second, and you're wondering what could this be? Uh, this uh, young woman who's got uh, hypotension, severe hypotension, basically coding uh, with uh, fluid possibly even blood. You can't really tell the difference between unclotted blood and fluid. It's fluid, it's fluid. But there's fluid there, hypotension, and not a scratch on her. And you're right, we immediately got the endocavitary transducer, and we placed that in the uh, vaginal vault. And you can see off to the left side of the screen there, there's active extravasation going on, if you will. There's bleeding happening right there in the, in the pelvis. And this is one of those times where um, in, in medicine where you can take two people, you can take two physicians who really speak two different languages, but it's the sound that binds them together, you know? The sound brought us together, me and my OBGYN colleagues. I show them this image and there's no more discussion, you know? We're, we're already squeezing um, O-negative blood into this patient based on the FAST exam and the hypotension, but now we know exactly where she needs to go next. She needs to go to the operating room. This was a ruptured ectopic pregnancy. So this turned out to be a really fun, uh, not fun, that's not the right word, a really exciting uh, case where ultrasound really made a huge difference. And we had these old janky ultrasound machines and shortly thereafter we had, and we've been trying at that point to get a new ultrasound machine and after these cases we had a um, new ultrasound uh, machine that arrived for our emergency department. And not only that, um, I started to really uh, pay more attention to medical students and, uh, and show real interest in their education and fostering them and being a good steward of their education and frankly started to get them really involved in ultrasound. And now we have a four year fully integrated ultrasound curriculum for medical students. Every medical student graduates with at least 70 hours of ultrasound in training before they go off to whatever specialty they're going to go into, even psychiatry. Um, Here's another case, uh, another one, never forget, this girl came in, didn't speak any English. About a third of our patients are, we live in this area in Orange County, California. My hospital's right next to Disneyland. Uh, it's in one exit from Disneyland, and there's a ton of Vietnamese patients in, in this part of the uh, United States. And there's, there's Vietnamese restaurants everywhere. So when I come here to Melbourne, Australia, there's like Vietnamese food everywhere. It's, like, it's like I'm home. It's like I'm home. 
Uh, and so, uh, so this gal got brought in and um, with the paramedics. Family called 911 because she was kind of sleepy and confused and sort of altered mental status. Uh, she was hypotensive and round, hard to engage, spoke Vietnamese only. We only know a few words of Vietnamese. We're struggling through this, waiting for a translator. Uh, and she's just sort of out of it and can't tell us anything wrong with her. All we know is we've got somebody who's basically sinus tag, 70 over pound. Uh, who uh, based, is almost like now becoming a GCS of three, you know, even um, unresponsive to deep painful stimuli. And so we, you know, we sort of intubate her, and we have in four of our resuscitation bays, we have a mounted ultrasound machine. So it's an ultrasound machine that's mounted on, on a boom that's zero footprint. So we can bring it right down onto the chest of the patient, spin it around, do a procedure, move it around the other way. It, it, there's no on the, on the, on the, uh, on the floor, there's no stand, right? So it makes, it's kind of like ultrasound, just swoops down from the sky like an angel. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so it's really convenient. I can't, I, I really, this is such a nice thing to have in your resuscitation days. I'm so lucky. Um, but so, that we, so we can do like intubation and a fasting at the exact same time, as long as you're the right people. We're sort of not getting in each other's way while we're doing this. And we do the fast exam, and then, sure enough, here we are, and we see a nice uh, free fluid here in, uh, in, in Morrison's pouch. You see the wedge of free fluid in there? Classic positive fast exam. And then, because we're, it's the same thing, you know, I'm reminded of that first case I had where there's no scratches on this patient, um, you know, hypotensive, and now we're starting to put it together. Um, but in, the, in that term, in, the, in our resuscitation phase, we don't have the immediate access to the endo, endocavitary transducer. Those are sort of around the corner in the sterilized container and everything. So we take the C60 Pro um, and uh, the curved, the big curved linear transducer, uh, and, um, and it, it was somebody referred to it really as the dumb Pro, which I thought was pretty funny because it's got all those elements and it actually makes a pretty good, pretty good looking picture. I think I think it's a pretty smart Pro. But we, what, do you, what, do we, what do you guys think we're looking at here? We're looking at the pelvis here. And by the way, now. Um, I'm starting to really be concerned about an ectopic, so I'm looking for an ectopic. I know that's on my differential now. I'm looking for an empty uterus and I'm looking for a mass, okay? And the bladder to differentiate kind of another anatomical landmark for me. And so here's the uterus right here, okay? So it's a transabdominal view of her pelvis, and this is all blood, clotted blood back here in the posterior cul de sac. So here's her uterus. There could be some fluid over here in the anterior cul de sac as well right up in here, uh, but then over here I see this mass right over here. You guys see that? And there's a little, there's a little something in there with the heartbeat. And so this is a live ectopic pregnancy that's basically rupturing and causing all this blood here. And so we zoom in on that ectopic. This is a new video. I zoomed in on that ectopic. And I don't know, if you look close, you might be able to see a little flicker going on here. It could be a live ectopic that's rupturing, hypotensive patient, squeezing in on negative, calling her OBGYN and calling I'm going to go back one slide, okay? That one slide. Now, OBGYN came down to the bedside. They're so used to, in the first trimester, endocavitary images, right? So they come down to the bedside. Now we have a little funny conversation. I say, uh, they said, this is what you're calling us? I said, yeah. She said, well, I see the pregnancy, but that's intrauterine. I said, um, <laughs> excuse me, you see what I'm no, just kidding. I said, uh, joking. Sort of. I said, um, other people were pointing that out, but, but we looked at this and I said, no, uh, you know, with all due respect, OBGYN resident, um, this is the uterus over here, it's actually empty, this is the posterior cul-de-sac, uh, there's definitely some blood back here, this is a mass that's outside the endometrial echo of the uterus, this is, and, and look at the patient. <laughs> <laughs> what's happening here. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Let's just book the OR. Let's book the OR. <laughs> but it was, a, and, I, and I was waiting for the endocavitary transducer because she, she kept asking about the endocavitary transducer, and I was, I'm all about that too. And I was waiting for that, but you know, we didn't have time. And the patient was an extremist. Went to the OR, and this person survived as well. Again, ultrasound, kind of like it's hair raising because in these cases, because it really did take us right to the brink of time, at the edge, at the edge of life and death. And then, like, the ultrasound, I think, really made the compelling argument. Can you imagine not having this and having to, like, wait around for someone to come and help us with this? I don't know. I think that would be really tough. Uh, so it tips us off to the diagnosis. In fact, ultrasound's good because it lowers our threshold to pick up life-threatening things. Right? I mean, we've talked about, my cases had to do with echoes and, 
and uh, gynecologic cases, obstetric cases, but really it's, it's triple A's, it's all over the body. It's picking up low threshold to pick up a life-threatening condition. Okay, so here's my third case, and we have to shift now. I don't know if you guys have this scenario yet, but we have so many patients boarding in the emergency department that we need to go upstairs to visit bed that the only place where we can really see a new patient now is out in the triage, basically out in the waiting room, right as they're coming off the street. And so now we stuck a doctor out in the, in the waiting room, essentially, seeing patients as they come in. So that's what we call our triage shift, and we hate this shift. The doctors hate it because you're basically practicing terrible medicine. Somebody is sitting in a chair around a bunch of other people, and I'm asking you all <laughs> kinds of you know, really personal questions, breaking hammer rolls left and right, and I'm like trying to ultrasound you out the trail. It's, no, it's so awkward, but we're trying to find those sick patients out there. It's, it's really the only chance we have to do that now with all these boarding patients. Now, we're trying to solve all, boarding a whole bunch of other ways of trying to do that, but in the meantime, we got the doctors out in triage. So, uh, yeah, this woman came in, 38 years old, right lower quadrant abdominal pain, sitting right out there in triage. She was feeling weak. Um, history of diabetes, she's on metformin. You know, you look down at her vitals, blood pressure is 90, heart rate's 130, uh, and you know, sitting in this room, like, okay, we need to move you from this chair. This is one gurney I have out in triage. I can pull a curtain around, I bring her in there, you know, because her vitals are unstable. Waiting for a bed to open up in the back. We just had three traumas roll in. Her urine pregnancy comes back, it's positive. She doesn't even know she's pregnant. Okay, so now I have this patient who doesn't know she's pregnant and she's hypotensive, and I'm sorry to go, whoa, this is like, we got an ectopic going here, so fast scan, uh, get in there uh, right away with uh, fast scan, and you can see here's the, the, you know, this liver, kidney, there's all this fluid over here, pretty obvious looking fast scan, it's positive, she's uh, hypotensive, I start acting on this right away, ordering some blood, um, and now I want to go down here and look at her pelvis, and uh, same thing, this is, uh, you can see this mass, these ectopics all start to look the same. It's a big, thick ring around uh, this structure here. So, and here's her empty uterus over here. Now, technically, in order to be diagnosed as an extra uterine gestation or ectopic pregnancy, and I'm going to go into these tips and tricks and tomorrow at some point. I'm, I'm, it's not clear, obviously, when I'm, when I'm like straight when I'm, <laughs> <laughs> At some point in my life, our lives, the next day or so, uh, we will be talking about the tips and tricks. And I'm going to really make it extremely clear to you, like what you know, the definitions of these things and the tips and tricks here. But if you've got somebody who's got uh, an empty uterus, some free fluid, and then a mass, a thick ring like this, even if you don't actually see the ectopic here, there's like a 97% chance that this is an ectopic just based on having an empty uterus, free fluid, and a mass. Certainly you throw in a little hypotension in this equation with a positive pregnancy test, even though it doesn't meet the exact criteria for an ectopic, this is your number one through 10 in the ED diagnoses right now, and you are chasing that down to the best of your ability. This is another transabdominal, uh, as Arun calls it, this is the dumb pro, but you know, it actually looks, makes some pretty looking images sometimes. If you push hard enough, you get some images, and here's that mass out here in the adnexa, empty uterus with the endometrial stripe here, free fluid. This is enough for me to get very excited about an, uh, an ectopic pregnancy. And the, the nice thing about transabdominal is I could do this right to you in front of all these people, kind of, without, I could not do that with endovaginal protocol. <laughs> Nobody in <laughs> no, this room would allow me to do that, much less the patient. So, you would need a chaperone. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And actually, for, for the transabdominals, you don't necessarily need a chaperone, especially in somebody who's an extremist. So the endocavitary, 100% of the time, I'm getting uh, chaperones. Um, so, this is, uh, this is how this case appears. We're kind of zooming in on it here now. Um, don't really uh, see, a, it, I don't see a little grain of rice or a yolk sac or fetal pole in here. You know, we'll go to that tomorrow a little bit more, but uh, certainly it's a mass, there's free fluid, it's got a big thick ring around it. This turned out to be uh, a rupture in your topic. All right. Uh, oh, here's another one. This 19 year old uh, female, she is, uh, oh yeah, this one. So this, this girl comes in, um, really uh, nice woman comes in. Her vital center state, she, as opposed to the other person who was like, the other cases were on death's door. This one's actually looking pretty good. She's just there. Um, she's got some right side abdominal pain, some vomiting for three days. She thinks it's probably 
uh, oh, she didn't know she was pregnant either. We do a pregnancy test, turns out it's positive. We're thinking maybe a little bit of hyperemesis gravidarum in the first trimester. Um, and, uh, but she had that right lower progeny abdominal pain. Now, you know, lateralizing abdominal pain in pregnant women always makes me wonder about ectopics, but there's another way more common thing that happens in pregnancy, which is corpus luteal cyst of pregnancy, or appendicitis, okay. But I like a corpus luteal cyst of pregnancy, super common. It's just the, the corpus luteum sort of nurture, uh, neutering, uh, you know, the pregnancy that's moving along. So it's super common, it's lateralizing. And as much as I'm excited about ectopics, I'm, I'm also sort of uh, bracing myself with this is just a simple corpus luteal cyst of pregnancy. So as I go to look at this patient, of course I always start off in the right upper quadrant. And do you guys see any free fluid on this one here? Here's the kidney, right here. The liver up here. Looks pretty negative. I'm, I'm fanning through it. And, um, yeah, okay. Pretty negative. Uh, oh, uh, fanning through. Oh, wait a minute. What's going on down over here? I mean, talk about a subtle positive fast scan. Okay, this is why you, I always remind people fast scan is not, you know, I tell this to the surgeons, it's not just. Plop it on, take it off. I mean, it's fanning up and down, superior, inferior. This is a big three-dimensional thing that we're doing here at, the, at, the, at Morrison's pouch. By the way, um, anybody know what muscle this is right here? So as very good, very good. Yep, this is right. So as so you're looking right here, and you see this little sharp angle, this wedge. That's all it takes. And now, are you ready for the next scan? This is a transabdominal ultrasound, and what's the diagnosis? Did it come up already? Oh no, good, okay. What's the diagnosis? That's right. One of the coolest cases ever. She wasn't unstable or anything, but it's just a cool case. Heterotopic pregnancy. Yep, she's got one in the adnexa, one in the, and she was not taking fertility medications. This girl didn't know she was pregnant. 19 year old Spanish female came in. Suddenly had a heterotopic pregnancy for no apparent reason whatsoever. You hear that the odds of having a heterotopic pregnancy are very low. What are they? One in 30,000. 30, who knows? <laughs> I had this case. So, yep, you can see um, here's, the, oh, here's the ectopic over here. Here's the uterus with an intrauterine pregnancy. The bladder is over here, nice and full. It's kind of nice to have a full bladder when you work at that large curved transducer, and this is your uh, ectopic outside here. So, and just had that tiny wedge of free fluid, you know, sort of as a tip off there, but um, there you go. So take home points, you want to leverage that fast exam every single time on these, on these patients. Um, endovaginal approach is often required. Think about transabdominal for that quick diagnosis using that large footprint uh, transducer. Push down hard enough, you can get some good images. And, oh, and uh, just because the fetus is big and has feel mo and actually has movement itself, you know, doesn't necessarily mean it's intrauterine. That's a 14-week uh, live ectopic you're looking at down there um, that we had. So, um, yeah, just uh, keep that in mind. That's a big one. Yeah, I was editing this video on an airplane. Actually, it's a kind of funny story. Not coming here, but in another flight. And the woman next to me goes, um, "Oh, uh, is that uh, is that your baby?" She thought that I was like staring at her. <laughs> And I'm like, uh, nope, that's not, no. And, and, she, and I'm like, well, I'm like, it's really interesting because this is the uterus over here, and this is the baby out here. So the baby is not in the uterus where it's supposed to grow. See, the uterus is empty. It's so interesting. And she's like, oh, well, how does the baby crawl into the uterus? <laughs> this is a kangaroo. What are you talking about? The joey has to in the And so I'm like, oh, no, it's really interesting. Actually, um, it can't do that. Uh, <laughs> and now the flight attendant is. Is kind of watching, you know, like look, peeking in on, like, what are you talking about? I'm like, oh, this is an ectopic, a tubal pregnancy. And then the woman says, well, what did you, so how do you, what do you do with the baby? Uh, how do you, and I said, oh, well, you know, you have to terminate the pregnancy surgically and this thing. And then she starts getting upset. And then, was, <laughs> and then the flight attendant kind of gives me this look like, you could have said it was a dream. You know? <laughs> she didn't say that, but she was thinking about it. So. Anyways, any questions about ectopic pregnancies? Okay, that's it. Thank you.